Millions of acres burned and more than a billion dollars spent. As the U.S. government runs out of money to fight wildfires, we look at the challenge of balancing the economic and environmental priorities. You're watching Inside Story from Washington. Welcome, I'm Libby Casey. Right now, 50 uncontained wildfires are raging across the country, and the government is about to deplete its annual firefighting budget before the season ends. It spent more than a billion dollars so far this year. And the U.S. Forest Service warns that this is the new normal in firefighting, bigger blazes, and dangerously parched seasons that last longer. So are there more effective ways to fight fires and limit the danger? Joining us to discuss the current state of wildfires and the rising costs of fighting them is Doug Inkley, senior scientist with the National Wildlife Federation. He specializes in wildlife conservation and ecology in a changing climate. And from Dallas, Sterling Burnett, senior fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. He works on environmental issues and government policies. But first, the facts. The think tank Headwater Economics, which researches Western land management, has looked at how much money the federal government spends managing wildfires wildfires, and they put the price tag at more than $3 billion a year. The biggest chunk goes to preparedness, that's $964 million, but putting out the fires isn't far behind in cost at $962 million. More than half a billion dollars goes to emergency funds, and another half a billion is spent to reduce hazardous fuels like dry brush and trees that become dangerous kindling. Back in 1990, the average cost of wildfires was less than a billion dollars. Now the price tag has tripled, and that doesn't even include the money spent by states and local agencies. Doug Inkley, we'll start with you. Why has the cost increased so much? Well, the cost of the fighting fires in the United States has increased due to a number of reasons, but the single most important thing here, I believe, is climate change. You know, that is the smoking gun, because what has happened is that climate change has made the fire season longer, and it's made it hotter, and it's made it, and it has also made it drier. All of these contribute to exacerbating the natural fires that would occur in the first place. Sterling Burnett, your thoughts on why the increase in cost? Well, I agree that it's multiple reasons. First off, you're having larger and larger fires. Since 1998, the increase in fires, the number of fires hasn't gone up that much, but the size of the fires has increased exponentially. So it went from 1.3 million acres to, in 2007, over 9 million acres. In 2011, almost 9 million acres at 8.7. I don't think that that can be attributed to climate change. I think it's attributed largely to bad management. Uh, after years of uh, management where you suppressed fires, fires are an entirely natural occurrence, but the size and the scope of the fires today is largely due to man's intervention. Uh, give us a portrait of this year's fire season, Sterling Burnett. We've seen more than 31,000 fires and more than 3 million acres burned, but this is considered uh, fairly average in terms of annual burn rate. Tell us more. Well, this year's fire season isn't over. 3 million acres is still much larger than it was 10 years ago. To, uh, uh, more than double, so I'd say that's not average, but it's well below what we've seen recently. Uh, the costs have spiraled because the size of the fires has gone up, and because uh, you talk about how much is appropriate every year, well they also plan for a certain amount of fires, but then they throw in emergency funds every year. I don't think that's going to be an issue, the spending issue. Well, Mr. Burnett mentioned management. We will get into that in the program, but I want to stay with this, Doug Inkley. The fire season this year, the federal government's about to run out of money for it uh, in terms of what they've allocated, and while they won't stop their efforts, they'll be able to draw on other pots of money. What does that say uh, about the federal government's allocation of resources? Well, the federal government is spending about 50% of its entire Forest Service budget on managing fire. That is a huge economic drain on the Forest Service and on our taxpayers. I absolutely believe, and I'm going to go against Sterling on this, by saying that the major factor here again is climate change. It is a lot harder, a lot harder to fight a fire 
when it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the winds are stirred up because of the excessive weather that we're having. What we need to do is recognize that this is a factor and we have to begin to address the underlying factor, not just try to put out the fire after it started. These automatic budget cuts well, uh, known as sequestration that kicked in this year when Congress and the White House couldn't come to terms on a budget plan has had an impact, says uh, the Forest Service, says the Bureau of Land Management. How so? Well, well it it, it makes the money unavailable by having the sequestration. And so what happens is the Forest Service is already cutting down some of its other activities so that they can use the money to instead fight forest fires. Sterling Burnett, do we spend enough money on this? Well, I don't know that we spend too little or too much. What I know is we spend it badly. Uh, I agree with Doug that, in fact, we shouldn't be fighting fires after the fact. Our disagreement, I suspect, is how to spend it before the fact. My uh, what you need for a forest fire is oxygen, fuel, a spark, and the right uh, environmental conditions. Every year we have forest fires. This isn't new, and our temperatures in the U.S. haven't risen for over 17 years. So I don't think it's new to climate change. It's due to management of our forest, wherein we're not treating the forest before the forest fire. We've cut down on our logging. We've cut down on our pre-treatment and so we're having to spend money on the back end when we should be spending it on the front end. Well temperatures are higher than ever. Nine of the last ten years have been the highest on record in the United States. To say that the temperatures aren't increasing is just plain wrong. We need to start with the science and the science says that we have increasing temperatures and it's contributing more to the forest fires. The research from the U.S. Forest Service and others has made that very, very clear. Gentlemen, we'll dig into this more in a few moments, but I, I want to look at this summer in particular. Where are the big fires that you've both been watching and, and, and paint us a picture of, of what the cost has been, both in terms of, of dollars and homes, but also human lives. We'll start with you, Doug Inkley. Well, it certainly sure. is. A, a terrible toll to see that human lives are being lost um, in the, on the, the places that they live. But in California, we've had about one third of the normal precipitation this year. Uh, that's associated with climate change because of the greater extremes we're experiencing from climate change. And so California has been having a record number of forest fires, and many other states did in the previous year, last year, which was much, much worse than this year. And last year was one of the, the, mm -hmm. the biggest firefighting uh, seasons on record. Sterling Burnett, where have you been watching? Where have you seen the most damage? Well, California, of course, is a big fire season every year, going back 15, 20 years. Uh, Colorado, the last couple of years, has been particularly bad. Uh, but any of the western states are tinderboxes right now. You have 190 million acres, according to the Forest Service, at risk of catastrophic wildfire. 40% uh, of those are U.S. Forest Service. So right now, Colorado is, is, has been burning. We've lost lives, we've lost property, you know, hundreds of buildings, both homes, uh, businesses. People get double hit when, they're, when their job goes up in flame and their house goes up in flame. Not only do they not have a home to stay in, but they don't have a job to go back to. Uh, it, it's catastrophic, I agree with Doug. Um, uh, once again, we're going to disagree over whether climate change is the reason. And we'll hear more about that from both of you in just a moment. When we come back, a warning from NASA why the U.S. is likely to see larger and more destructive wildfires. More on that after the break. Welcome back to Inside Story. The early cost of wildfires goes beyond the dollar signs. Homes are destroyed and lives are lost. Now NASA scientists say the destructive power of these fires is here to stay and will likely get worse. Earlier, I spoke with NASA Earth scientist Douglas Morton, and I asked him how this current fire season fits into NASA's projections. One of the amazing things we can do here at NASA is to go back in time and look at the occurrence of fires across the U.S. or other parts of the world based on our satellite data. That allows us to do that uh, time series analysis, take a look at where we are today and where we've been. Um, we see an increase over the U.S. in particular in the total amount of wildfire over the last 30 years. So yes, this year is an average fire season, but overall we're trending towards more large wildfires and more overall burned area across the U.S. So Doug Morton, what does that mean for firefighting efforts and in terms of how to prepare for wildfire season and then how to deal with it? 
Well, certainly the earlier start we've seen this year to wildfire fighting uh, in Southern California and other parts of the Southwest uh, makes for a much longer and therefore more difficult uh, fire suppression season. Uh, the conditions we've seen have been particularly intense. Obviously, this has been a very damaging year for wildfires. Those very hot and dry conditions, and especially when you've got people living in and around very flammable regions, uh, makes it very difficult for firefighters and obviously for those communities. It makes it more difficult for those communities. Elaborate on what this means for Americans in terms of where they live and, and how they live and what they should expect in the future. Well, certainly we're living in a warmer world, and so that means a world where fire will be at greater risk. And so as we make our decisions about where to live and, and how to construct our communities, it's certainly important that we continue to prepare for the likelihood that fires, especially in regions like the western U.S., the mountains, um, that we're going to see those fires increasing in frequency in the coming years. As the federal government looks at how it battles blazes, uh, how do these models and these forecasts come into their vision of where they put their resources and how they think differently about preventing fires from even starting? One of the unique things we can do with the different NASA satellites we have in orbit is obviously we can look at the actively burning fires and the smoke they generate. We can also look at how dry the landscape is becoming and therefore have an, a, a sense of where the fire risk will be the greatest. Some of my research in places like the Amazon is specifically trying to target that. Can we know three or six months ahead of time that this will be a big wildfire season? And so preparing our wildfire uh, firefighting teams is also preparing those communities and regions with, with greatest risk is, is one of the new and important ways that we're using NASA satellite data to help uh, guide uh, some of the resource management you're talking about. To continue our discussion, we still have with us Doug Inkley, Senior Scientist with the National Wildlife Federation, and in Dallas, Sterling Burnett, Senior Fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. Uh, Mr. Burnett, how do you use the tools that we just heard Douglas Morton talk about uh, in future prevention? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there are four characteristics necessary for wildfires, and one of them is fuel. And what we can do is what we were doing in previous decades. Uh, you know, part of the reason we have these wildfires is a huge fuel buildup. And why is that? Well, because the Smokey the Bear campaign was successful. For 50 years, we preached suppress every wildfire. And we did. And when that happened, we had a huge fuel buildup. So going from 25 to 50 acres per tree to more than 300 to 900 acres, a lot of those trees are dead and dying. We need to clear the brush. We need to remove dead and dying timber and replace it with growing young timber. Uh, we need to increase logging, which has dropped over 80% on our national forest, from 12 billion board feet to less than 3 billion board feet. And we need to open up some of the roads that we previously closed so firefighters can get in and fight these fires more easily. Let's start with the, the let it burn policy. Sterling Burnett, the Forest Service, says it did uh, start doing more of a, a let it burn way of coping with fires about 20 sure. years ago. Still, you, need, you say there's a need That's for right. more. Well, no, I, I think that uh, the burn baby burn policy that they did was disastrous, especially after they built up all the fuel with the suppression. You've got four choices when you're managing wildfires. You can do mechanical thinning and logging. You can do prescribed burns, which the Forest Service has done more of, but sometimes those get out of control as it did a few years ago in Los Alamos fire when 400 uh, structures were burned to the ground because a prescribed burn got out of the control. You can, as, as I would recommend, at least selling off part of the public lands, including to private individuals, to uh, states, to public companies, and to even to environmental groups, because I think they would do a better job managing many of these lands. Or you have your burn baby burn policy, and we've experienced that now for going on 20 years, and we see the results. Doug Inkley. Well, our national forests were established by that great conservationist, uh, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And in 1960, Congress passed a law that said, our forests shall be used for multiple use, sustainable use. They are not tree farms for the production of just logging. They are for multiple use. They provide recreation. They provide logging. They provide grazing lands. They provide fish habitat. They provide wildlife habitat. We cannot look at them as a single use public lands. They are held by the general public, you, me, and Sterling, it, by the government, in the interest of the general public. We should not be selling these off to the, to the private landowners. This is a resource that provides clean air, it provides clean water, it provides lumber for building our homes. What about the let it burn policy? Well, the let it burn policy, uh, 
I th think it would be wrong to characterize it as something that was the only way that the Forest Service managed it. Smokey Bear had some issues, but the Forest Service has long now recognized that there needs to be a combination of factors. One of those is to let some wildfires burn, but others is controlled burning. Logging is not the solution to all the problems on the national forest. We'll get more into this in just a moment. How to manage America's lands to prevent and fight wildfires after the break. We'll look at the options from logging trees to letting fires burn out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside Story. Fire seasons are getting more severe and Americans are building their homes near forests and wildlands in increasing numbers, raising the stakes when fires start. So what are the best ways to prevent blazes and help save lives? Well, still with us to continue the conversation is Doug Inkley, senior scientist with the National Wildlife Federation, and in Dallas, Sterling Burnett, senior fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. Sterling Burnett, I want to pick up on something you mentioned before the break uh, about who can controls America's forests and wild lands. How would you measure when enough development is enough to cure a, a real problem with wildfires? Well, this is America, and we believe in private property. In fact, this country was founded on the idea of private property, not public holdings. The government owns over one-third of the land in the U.S., so when people build on their private property, I don't think it's their, it's the government's job to say, you can't build that. But they should be warned they should acknowledge when they build there that they're at risk of wildfires. They're building there because they want to be near a forest. Now the question is, can the forest around them be managed better, both for, as Doug said, recreation, we lose money on that, it's the largest money loser the Forest Service has every year, both for firefighting, for wildlife habitat, because species get destroyed, uh, their habitat gets destroyed every time there's a wildfire. Uh, so we need to do a better job of that, and that might reduce some of the damage done to people's homes and businesses. So if you build, towns aren't going to get up and move. Sure, if you if you build your house on the doorstep of a forest, should you have to pay for the damage if your house burns down? Who should put the bill? You should. Well, you should better. You better be insured. I know I have insurance on my home if I have a fire. So you should be insured for the damage to your property. All right, Doug Inkley. But you should also probably take precautions to make sure uh, the timber around your home is far enough set back that you're doing what you can to, uh, on your end, to prevent fire from coming. And should that be your responsibility or should the government uh, tell you how much clear cutting you should do, how much of uh, a clear space, safe space you should create around your property or your house? Well, no, I don't think that's the government's job. All right, to, let's to go to Doug Inkley to get, get a response. Yeah, how much risk should, should the American public bear? Well, the Forest Service is already working with local towns and communities at the, you know, the urban forest interface so that they can try to minimize the fire risks to those communities and so that when there are fires, those communities are able to deal with it on their own with outside input. So they're trying to make it safer. That's important because those national forests need to be protected for the citizens of the United States and the many products that they provide. People have to understand that when you build near a forest, you are taking increased risk. If you build on a coast along the Atlantic coast, you are taking an increased risk because of the environmental conditions. Shouldn't you bear some of the cost of that? You have to, you have to recognize that this is an, a diverse environment and you, everyone needs to behave in a responsible manner. And that's taking responsibility, not trying to throw it all on the federal government. How different does the map of America look right now, Doug Inkley, in terms of where Americans are building their homes, how uh, much they're coming closer or not to, to forests and national lands? Well, the nice thing about the Forest Service lands is that they do not allow the development within those lands. So that does provide those areas where fires can burn naturally in their ecological way, uh, where people will not be in harm's way because they've been sold off to public, private interests and are now building homes in these forests that need to be protected and managed appropriately for all citizens. Okay, and Sterling Burnett, earlier you talked about these public lands and who should manage them. How much management should uh, be done? And let's get back to this question of when is enough enough? Well, if as long as the public owns the forest, it ought to be managed for the benefit of the public. And that includes, as Doug said, wildlife habitat. But it improves it includes uh, environmental quality as a whole. It should be managed to reduce wildfires for pollution. It should be managed to increase water flows and stream flows. It should be managed to 
help wildlife to flourish. And that's not how it's being managed today with the hands-off approach. In some forests in the western states, there's more dead and dying standing timber than there is growing timber. And that needs to be reduced, Technically, both for wildfire reasons. Yeah, I just want to get, how does that match with, with your vision of, of the management picture right now? How is it being done, and then what would you have it look like, ideally? Well, we have to separate what's happening today from what's happening in the long term. We need to be fighting those forest fires that are dangerous. We also need to be looking at this from the long-term perspective. And I'm going to go back to the same issue I brought up at the beginning, which is climate change. It is fueling our forest fires, making them hotter and making them more dangerous and making them more destructive of the natural habitats that are out there. So we need to address the issue of climate change by going to a clean energy future, which reduces our carbon emissions. And then we also need to deal with this issue right up front, what's happening this year to protect people's homes and their lives from forest fires. And Sterling yeah. Burnett's painting a picture of a hands-off management, that they're just sort of letting things grow wild. Give us a vision of how you think it's being done and what you think should be done. The Forest Service management is far from hands-off. They have that multiple use mandate for recreation, uh, for fisheries, for wildlife, for grazing, uh, and for timber production. They are actively managing most of the Forest Service lands for production of these outputs. The National Park Service lands are closer to hands-off. The United States Forest Service lands are meant to produce good products for the United States citizens, for everybody. It is being put at risk, at greater danger, by climate change. Sterling Burnett, a response? Well, increasing amounts of these national forests are being put off limits as wilderness areas. And wilderness areas are strictly hands-off. You can't get in there and mechanically thin them. You can't build roads. What you can do is fly a helicopter over, and that's not helping the forest. And Doug Inkley? That's not helping the wildlife. That's not helping pollution. Doug Inkley, what, what does the future look like? Well, the future for our national forests is we have to keep them in public ownership. We have to address this issue of climate change, and we have to deal with the short-term issues of making our communities safer and helping the Forest Service to manage those urban forest interfaces for the safety of everybody while preserving the forest as well. And Sterling Burnett, I want to get a quick picture from you of the future. Well, I'm afraid we're going to see more of the same because even when the Forest Service tries to do the right thing, environmentalists tie up Forest Service plans in courts for years. So logging can't be done, so management can't be done, even so prescribed burns sometimes can't be done because they have a vision of let nature take, take its course. Is there a middle ground that we can reach, gentlemen? I mean, Sterling Burnett, could, could you be content with, with some uh, heightened private interest being able to, to do increased logging, to have an increased presence in the forests? And, and could we hear from you, Doug Inkley, uh, a concession to, to allow more development? Is there, is there a middle ground? Well, I'm not necessarily talking about development, and I'm not, and, it, and I'm, it, though I'd like to see more uh, of the public lands in private holdings, I think that's what this country was founded on, but I would say, even if they remain in public holdings, they should be managed more actively, and that means, to some extent, Congress getting involved in saying, when the Forest Service determines a forest plan, it can't be sued to stop that forest plan. Okay, we and Doug Inkley, very briefly. Uh, oh, I've got to cut to you off, Sterling. Doug Inkley, brief response. Congress, Congress has already mandated that the Forest Service shall secure public input in the development of each and every forest management plan. And they also allow for public engagement on those lands, whether it's recreation or forestry, forestry or grazing. Thank you, gentlemen. That's it for now from the team in Washington, D.C., and from me, Libby Casey. Thanks for watching.